Hey, nice to see you. Hi, David. Um, hey, Hi, Fraser. Folks. So, so just for people who are tuning in, what Fraser and I are doing is we're trying to do scenario planning on our communal tabletop here, and we are both. Uh, we both did scenario planning many, 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 many years ago to some degree, and we're very rusty. And so we've been looking online and reading things and watching videos and stuff. And we think that it's really a fun exercise to consider plausible futures uh, and to prepare for those if you're an organization, but also it helps us sort of think about what could happen in the world and whatnot. We got together last week and we spent some time considering sort of the future of work uh, now that this pandemic looks like it will forever change the nature of work, perhaps. So we started to think about what some of those um, issues would be. And so what, I, what I'm going to do now is give you a little, a little peek at, the, at some of the stuff that we did last time. And we know that a lot of this needs um, some work and to, to kind of uh, put it together in some coherent whole. I've, I've done some lines on the table because one of the popular methodologies for scenario planning is to figure out uh, 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 two axes of high and low or extreme uh, phenomenon that you can create a four quadrant scenario. Uh, four scenarios and four quadrants from. And we haven't gotten to that stage yet. But what we started to do when we considered the future of work is we thought, let's let's think about things from the point of view of a mid-sized company and let's consider the next 10 years, let's say. And we threw out, and, and these are some of the domains that we knew we had to be wary of, like the economy, geopolitics, the environment in terms of ecology, technology, social changes, all that kind of stuff. So those are the domains that we sort of put in one corner to remind ourselves of the types of things we'd have to consider. And here are some of the highlights of what we discussed. Um, this, this cluster over here was, I thought, really, really interesting because we started off talking about AI and robotics and how that might change the future of work. And that led to a whole discussion about how there's this sort of um, populist nationalistic movement against immigration and migrants and, and this idea that globalization is bad and we should repatriate manufacturing and stuff and, and no longer do outsourcing. And it seemed like this would feed in really nicely to this concept that, that if you really double down on robotics and AI in your workplace, you could then do less um outsourcing and you would appear you know you wouldn't rely upon migrants as much so in terms of the kind of populist movement which is part of the you know uh, geopolitics it seemed like this cluster was something that would be very interesting to explore and if there were more workers involved in other activities than traditional manufacturing and whatnot we sort of wondered if that meant that more and more of your actual staff would be working in marketing or something and design and less in the making of things. Um, and while we're on that topic, you know, and I'm just gonna throw out sort of like 3D printing because we didn't really discuss that, but that whole idea of uh, distributing manufacturing across multiple uh, sites is, is an interesting topic. And that comes over here, I think, segues into whether we were to be experiencing more high employment or more self-employment, and that got us onto a discussion about freelance working. Um, and then, you know, what, as a consequence of that, there may be less commuting, there may be, you know, distributed working is maybe another way of describing freelance working, which is that, that you have an organization where your employees are spread literally right across the globe. Um, and they work from home or work from some other place that suits them, but you don't have to provide them with a work environment. They just need the tools, the digital tools to do so. Um, we also talked about the sort of the concentration of monopoly, whether that would continue, because it certainly has been the trend the last couple of decades. Um, and fangs are like Facebook, Amazon, Apple, sorry, Facebook, Apple, um, and you have Amazon, you have Microsoft and those companies that are, the, the, the acronym needs to be, uh, there's another acronym that's a little better that encompasses them, but essentially these 
largely tech companies that have become enormous in terms of market capitalization, but actually employ very few people, um, but have huge dominance uh, in the marketplace. And then, you know, down here was sort of questions about what is an office and do we need them and um, what happens to urban centers. And, and there's one here, sorry, that got stuck on the side, which is about whether, and this is a point that you, Fraser, in particular brought up, which I thought was interesting, is would there be sort of non-governmental, uh, not-for-profit social services? In other words, if the government isn't providing any kind of social, if the social services are crumbling, it, would there be other quasi public private entities that would crop up to fill that gap? So this is maybe interesting in terms of education because in many of the, much of the Western world with exceptions, of course, there are places in the, the US is a good example of this where public education has been deteriorating you know, quite severely over the decades because of a lack of investment and whatnot. And so the rise of the kind of private school system has been profound, you know, at all levels of education. And those are obviously profit driven. And so they have all kinds of unintended consequences from that. And so it makes you wonder, like parochial schools or other schools that, um, that kind of fit in between those, whether they would um, try to soak up that, the, the, the gap and, and make a difference. So I thought that was interesting. So that's kind of an overview. Dave, uh, yeah. Dave, can I, can I, sorry, um, if I, if you want to edit this out, say so, mm. but um, <laughs> go for it. You, you've given your, your quadrants, your four core quadrants, four corners. Um, mm. Have, can you, and we didn't apply that right at the beginning of our talk. No. And perhaps I think we so said I, this time around, we would try I've, and, I've drawn we would try the and lines, agree in advance. But I don't, I've drawn the lines, drawn the but, lines we have but, but we don't know what the axes are. We don't know what those are. But do you, could, could, do, you, do you have a view what those axes, given the, the post-its that you've got laid out, do you have a, a view of what those axes are as an example? If they're not precise, even it doesn't matter, but just to help people... Well, I have what, what okay. those axes might be, for example. I, I have thought about it. I th I mean, I don't know if this fits perfectly. Well, basically, we had an open discussion and we came up with these, we we're sort of brainstorming these different things and we stopped it there. And now we have to think of what these axes might be. I mean, one one area that um, that I, oops, I, think I can't think and write at the same time, but one area uh, that I think is an interesting split is um, this one, which is on everyone's mind at the moment. And I'll put that just here for a moment, which is co-location versus distributed. This is about the workforce. So on one extreme, the workforce is co-located in physical spaces together because there's a powerful, let's say, networking effect, let's say, of being by the water cooler or whatnot. Or the opposite extreme is distributed, where everyone is working from wherever, using digital tools to uh, assemble uh, their work. So that's one kind of axis I could see where you could have co-location distributed, and you could look at the extremes. Um, and that looks see. roughly like your north-south distribution in in that particular set of uh, post-its, doesn't it? I would have thought. Uh, do we need offices in the south and monopoly firms in the north? Um, sort of fits with that. Yeah, and, and there's and there's also um, I I mean this just to get us started. Um, I could offer another option, which is to do with high and low automation. Um, so. Maybe that's not quite the right idea, but I think this is quite fascinating. When you think about, you know, the extremes of co-location distributed and distributed extreme, distributed manufacturing is a, is a is a form to me of kind of I don't know. Maybe it's low automation. It's not the way to put it because it's very, you know, you're dealing with kind of pods uh, versus like being able to have economies of scale and scope of things that are in the co-location uh, environment. So uh, maybe it's not high. Well, high and low automation is whether you go to, I guess, people or you go to robotics. Um, you know, if it's, 
or maybe high employment, low employment. Maybe that's maybe that's you know another one because that would affect. Um, uh, but your example is a, you that the with... example you just brought up is a is a very good one, David. Of of the three D printing on the right hand side you've got there. For those who don't know, I've been part of a, a uh, won't know anybody. David might. Uh, it's about eight thousand volunteers in two self-formed groups in the last six weeks 8,000 volunteers each with a 3d printer in the uk printing ppe full face visors for hospitals doctors community nurses that sort of thing and so that they have produced you know i can only produce 20 a day but 8,000 people producing 20 a day is a hell of a lot of ppe kit more than any one manufacturer can produce and we self-formed over the internet no one's making a profit. We're donating it, and some people are fundraising to cover their costs, but no more. Uh, so that's a, it's a very real example. This is a, a 21st century cottage industry, and there are already people discussing on those uh, self-formed communities of uh, print groups, how do we get CE certification? How do I get British standard certification for the stuff? So the CE standard is an approval for the design. The British standard is for the individual manufacturing the kit so that it's approved, made by bunches of individuals on a freelance basis, basically. Um, so this a, that's something that popped out of thin air as a consequence of the current crisis. But well, it's, I, you, yeah, it's real. I, and I'm I think very, it will I'm very already excited about massively... That. No, I, yeah, I think it's... It I will, think it's... It, it, there are people okay. already talking in those groups when we're past when we're past the worst well, hopefully we will at some point see an end to this pandemic although there are murmurings it may never go away but that's another thing that, that people saying wouldn't it be good if we could uh do this stuff uh self-form to make items for sale that other people need locally um can we collaborate can we collaborate on our purchasing power. So these groups have already, within the course of six weeks, have got bulk purchasing power. Rather than me going online and paying £25 for a roll of printer filament, there's 8,000 people now buying as a bulk, negotiating a deal as a group, self-appointed negotiators from that group, going to the printer filament people saying, you know, we've got 8,000 people want to buy your stuff, but we're not going to pay £25 a roll, we're going to pay 18 because we're not, we're doing this not for profit, and they responded. They stepped up to the mark. Uh, the, the the filament suppliers. So it's that everything mm. you've drawn out there. I I didn't really mention last week when we were discussing it, but that's the reality of what. Well, I'm has I'm been excited. Created from this crisis. I'm excited to think about that because I think that that's a that is an inkling into what may happen in other industries in other ways. Yes, because abs when, absolutely. Because when when the when the 3D printing. I, you know, I can't remember what it's called, but there's this sort of uh, this curve that people look at when it talks about adoption in the in the marketplace, where you start out with something getting terribly overhyped, like blockchain or cryptography, and then when it gets overhyped, yeah. it sort of plummets because people get very disappointed in the initial outcomes. It doesn't fulfill the dreams, but then so eventually it doesn't live, up to, its yeah, it doesn't live up to its hype, and then eventually, so there's this hype cycle. Then when it's in the trough people who still believe in it sort of beaver away and do things to make it more viable. And then it has this, this increasing investment until it results in a huge kind of um, leap of innovation and, and long-term economic benefit. So 3D printing, it seems to me, was like that because it came on the scene. Everyone said, oh, isn't this amazing? Everyone can be a maker. And there were all these makers communities and lots of people doing this, but it didn't really become a massive thing. It was always kind of a, a cottage hobbyist thing. And you're saying that in this crisis, people are starting to see, oh no, we can mobilize and professionalize all of this activity to achieve something much greater. Yeah. And that could lead to what we're talking about, a situation where 3D printing really is distributed manufacturing in a major way. And it's not a hobby thing, but it's done as yeah. a form of, so if you need PPE, you don't have to rely on China anymore or whatever. You just print it locally uh, to get what you need. And this reminds me of the kind of local versus big box vendor argument. Like, you know, do you buy from the local grocer or do you get it from Tesco's? And so 
these these debates seem to me to be on similar sides of that coin. It's sort of do you how much resource do you put on sort of local self sufficiency versus economies of scale and whatnot? And what we've discovered, I think, is that monopolies are very brittle. You know, they 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 are great when oh, yeah. when there's not much um, chaos, like when they can really aggregate all that capital and all those resources and things and get economies of scale and scope and all the rest of it. Amazing. But when there is enormous stress in the marketplace and chaos and whatever, they're very brittle. Everything breaks. Um, another example of this, I think, the tuna. is- Tuna. I think it was Tuna, the, uh, an acronym that the Oxford group, side business school group used, wasn't it? Uh, How do you say it? Uh, it? Turbulence, uncertainty. What was it? Tuna. Do you remember their acronym? No, no. Is it T-U-N-E-R anyway, right. or okay. something? Okay. I no, tuna as in the fish. Oh, tuna fish. Tuna okay. as in the fish. Okay, so we're going to look um, up. Turbulence, uncertainty. Tuna. Anyway, don't worry. It's... So we're going to find out tuna. But that but was I exactly was... the comment they made. But I mean, the, 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 the interesting, uh, I'm going to write this sort of note to myself. I'm going to call it restaurants rendering because uh, that's a little shortcut for me. And that is simply that, that um, I listened to a chef uh, of a very famous restaurant here who was being asked about the pandemic and his thoughts and everything. And he said, he said, you know, we've done a terrible and very stupid thing. You know, he said, you know, there's a lot of people employed in the restaurant industry. Uh, we just saw 5 million of them file for unemployment in the last uh, few weeks. And he said, you know, that was really unnecessary because he said, what's happening now is there's a lot of food that can't get to market because the, the growers and the processors that prepare that food have prepared it for cafeterias and schools and nursing homes and all the, these types that they're like sort of, uh, they, they, they prepare them in sizes and packaging and whatnot that is suitable to those environments. And so they can't easily direct that to grocery stores or supermarkets or whatever, because they can't just make the new packaging that's required and whatnot to do it. And so he said, you have the situation where a lot of food is just rotting in the fields because it just can't be packaged and distributed in, the, in a way that it needs to, given the current pandemic. And that's one of the brittle, brittle facts of the system. Whereas he said, if you look at restaurants, he said, what are they? They're food processing plants. They're rendering the, you know, plants. So he said, if you divert all that food to restaurants and you pay the restaurants to stay open, they can butcher the meat and break it down. They can take large canisters of, you know, multi-gallon canisters of milk and re-break it and render it. And they can process that food into meals that you could then distribute to whomever. And so you could keep that whole operation running. You just, just repurpose all those people and all that activity to solve the immediate crisis. So he said, you know, letting all those people go out of work and then forcing those restaurants out of business was a, it was a terrible oversight and very stupid because it could have been used in a yeah. different way. So I think of that local versus yeah. big box mentality that if you said, you know what, we have all these local uh, processing plants called restaurants and we could use those in a new way to feed people during a crisis. And that's what we should do. So that's the thing to do with the, like the flexibility. Uh, and, and David, my... my Sorry, I just, just to, uh, to to pause on that, that to add absolute credibility to your point. Um, you know, restaurants went from one night to the, one day to the next, being shut out of the equation, but they had all their orders and everything else backlogged. And you remember last week I talked to you about the volunteer group that I put together, and one of my jobs in the local isolation volunteer group was to negotiate with the big superstores locally so that our volunteer shoppers could go and shop for mm. lots of people. And I met the manager, the tes the main guy was the Tesco guy. And I told you quite a lot about his interesting takes on this. One of the things he said is when the, 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 the staple diet calories, so the flour, the tinned beans, uh, tomatoes and pasta and loo paper flew off the shelves. Mm -hmm. He said, <laughs> this is not a shortage of stuff. This is stuff from our suppliers that is normally bought directly by the, you know, it will come back online because it's you know, as a whole, you know, 20% of this week's calorific intake would have gone through restaurants and takeaways in the UK. So that's 20% of the calorific intake this week would have 
been channeled into the human population through the restaurants and they're not allowed to do anything with it so it's going to take a month for those distribution channels to for stock and food to be redirected from the restaurants and come into our own supply chain um and for those who don't know tesco's supplies 30 percent of the calories in the uk every year in terms of groceries i mean it's amazing so I mean, that majorly is majorly important in that's this, a true in, monopoly in <laughs> yes yeah, like, oh boy well no yeah. i mean that so Tesco, who is it? Tesco, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, and Morrison's, and Aldi. Between them, they've got between twenty, fifteen, and twenty percent market share each. Hmm. At fifteen to thirty percent market share each. So it's in. They are, yeah. You know, and and interesting that they agreed early on when suddenly there was all this panic buying. They agree, that there was a an explicit and public agreement not to behave as monopolies. They said if we start pricing our stock based on higher than normal demand and upping the price in places we will just self-exacerbate a problem we will make this situation worse and it's already a nightmare um so they no prices have gone up as far as i can tell in the uk based on scarcity in the shops because the stock the mm. shops knew these were not there wasn't really a scarcity at all people didn't need to eat eat 50 percent more they just were buying 50% more each week. So anyway, you're yeah. absolutely right. This well, monopoly, this another, knee-jerk reaction. I mean, this idea and of a Sorry, and, and the last yeah, thing, yeah. Some, something I... Sorry, just to, to add to your... To, to, I will be very quick because I butted mm. in on your flow, was the another thing the side uh, business school group were talking about was the zero stock supply, the vulnerability, not vulnerability yeah. of the monopoly uh, or fragility of monopolies, but the vulnerability of the zero stock supply chains, or just in time, as yeah. we used to call it, I think they called it the zero yeah. stock supply chain. Hmm. It, it, you know, it fell apart instantly because, you know, they, 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 just the supply chain wasn't able to cope with the change in social distancing laws. So well, it wasn't also, so much the monopolies, the, although it is the... monopolies that. It's a lack of redundancy. Everything well. that goes with a monopoly, everything that goes with a monopoly, is this just-in-time supply uh, to keep their stock levels down. But that is a second tier of fragility, uh, which came out of this. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted you, David. Yeah, I'm actually going to say it's um, kind of a discussion of optimization versus redundancy, where um, you yes. know the pandemic has made clear the need for redundancy um and people don't normally do that because it costs money and so when you're doing everything from a profit motive and you don't have a pandemic for 100 years or now it's more like you know 15 years uh, people say well why are you spending all this money yeah. on something that isn't necessary so the need to optimize means that you take out excess capacity or redundancy and so that leads to hey just in time is awesome until you have a pandemic i noticed this personally in that you know i can't get disinfectant wipes wipes for love or money from any of the major vendors you, you go, i go to amazon nothing i go to uh costco which is a big you know online box retailer nothing so you go right down the line there's none now of course yes you can make your own and that's what i started to do but i just found it funny that for literally two and a half months you cannot find a disinfectant wipe and i went into a store a federal express store that had some on the table in the back behind the and i said i said where'd you get that they said oh you've got to um go to your local Walmart, find out when their next delivery is and get there at 4 a.m. before anybody else and, and swoop in, right? And I was like, this is this is crazy, right? And I was traveling, I, I live in San Francisco and I was in another part of the Bay Area in a suburb of another town. I go into their, their local hardware store and while they didn't have disinfectant wipes, they had everything else that you can't find anywhere else like gloves and masks and stuff like this. <laughs> And I said to them, how come you guys have all this stuff? And they said, oh, because we only let people buy one or two of them, you know? So we, we ration it out to customers. Uh, and I was like, well, that's brilliant, you know, because it means that everybody can get some, you know, rather than this, uh, this kind of yeah. uh, all or nothing, you know, just pay us and you'll get what you want model. And so I'm going to suggest maybe another way of kind of looking at some of the 
extremes of scale versus scope. I don't know if that's the right terminology, but it seems to me that monopolies are all about scale and the local is something to do with scope because you can have all this um, you know, redundancy and, and, and whatnot. So something about optimization. Well, and, and speak, speaks, speaks to resilience. It, it, it speaks to resilience, doesn't it? Um, but there's something just looking at the five, uh, the seven cards in your top left, um, we've got geopolitics and we didn't put governmental, uh, or let, no, you did, you put legislation up there. Yeah. Sorry. And it's like, something, yeah, you know, government again, to, yeah. yeah, well, no, you've put legislation. So let's call that government. Um, so a good example with the PPE scarcity in the UK, um, and the U S was <laughs> that. And in the US, okay, so uh, where else? Um, the, the right grade of filter fabric that's used for these face masks um, is uh, a 30 micron filter. I won't go into the technicalities, but there's a certain grade that's required for use in hospitals. And it's the highest grade of paper face mask you get. So I've been asked by a dentist friend to come up with a customized printed um, molded face mask. We can scan and customize these face masks for the individual because people have very different shaped faces and a dentist, dentists are not allowed to work in the UK at the moment except in hospitals with specialist full face positive pressure masks because they get very close to their patients mouths and the drills create an aerosol mm -hmm. and they can't work. Yeah, it's so very this dangerous. guy asked me to well, it's very dangerous work, work environment. Printing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it is uh, for every for both parties. Um, so I think okay. So you need a, a printed mask, and that means an interchangeable paper cartridge. And then I started speaking to the. I needed to find source of the right grade filter paper, and all the filter producers. I spent a day on the phone. All the filter producers in the UK or distributors in the UK said, "We can't supply you any." I said, "Even a square meter." He said, "No." Government has requisitioned the first million square meters of filter fabric so they can control the supply of PPE in the event it becomes really bad. So uh -huh. by, by, by trying to protect everybody, government intervened. This knee-jerk reaction is, um, you know, as with closing restaurants down so quickly and announcing – that there will be no exams in schools this summer, way before they closed the schools, which meant that all the kids had nothing to aim for. A lot of these knee-jerk reactions, all made with the best of intent, mm -hmm. don't appear to have been thought through quite as carefully. We talked, David, about whether government had done scenario planning, but I'm not sure they have done much scenario planning around these things. You can bet your bottom dollar they will be now, because well, well, you say that, but a lot in of the, this, in the, in the a lot US, of this good intent mm, with you know here in the U.S. with uh, go ahead. There's there's probably you know when this is all going to be over and people are going to examine what happened um, already. Uh, there have been you know uh, uh, press articles about how there were you know, scenarios run about this. In fact, there's a famous one that occurred in the summer of last year um, where uh, the New York Times, I think it was, and it brought together scientists and government personnel and whatever, and did a simulation of a pandemic coming out of, um, coming out of um, the Middle East, I think it was, or, or the Europe. And yeah, they the did that simulation. The and they did that simulation and they, provided to everyone, you know, uh, a sort of takeaway of what needed to be done. Plus, earlier in the year, there was a similar activity by another group. Then we had the Netflix um, miniseries Pandemic come out in August 2019, which discussed okay. preparedness and what people were doing to prepare for pandemics. And then the Obama administration, you know, like, like administrations before it, had done lots of different um, scenarios. They had even stockpiled a lot of equipment and whatnot, and they handed that over to the next administration. The next administration said, well, let's cut all these costs. This is ridiculous. So so apparently yeah. we have had a lot of preparation and there are a lot of people that know just what to do in this situation, but none of that has been allowed to really run its course properly. And so there's been political intervention, um, which has mm -hmm. led to a terrible outcome 
but because we don't have a, 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 an environment of political accountability here, um, nothing can be done about it. And you can't course correct because, sure. Um, sure. you know, you can point fingers as much as you want, but it doesn't, it doesn't resolve in any different outcome. So people are just unfortunately mm. having to just uh, accept the fate that this is going to be a terrible disaster here. And, you know, we'll yeah. try to mitigate what we can, but it's, yeah, a no, it's, thing, it's, you know? it's, you're right. It's, it's, it's wrong of me to claim there was no scenario planning. I think mm. the, you know, it's scenario planning is, as someone said, is, is, not about risk and probability assessments. It's um, dealing with uncertainties and the plausibility of how you deal with those uncertainties, ideas about how you deal with it. And, you know, there are just some examples where our, the UK government at least, and I suspect quite a few of the other European governments must have done some sort of scenario planning. They probably don't do scenario planning, they prob or not as much as they could. They do risk analyses. Yeah. And analyzing the, risk the, and analyzing the military the does a lot of uncertain. that's the military's yes. job, isn't it? They do a lot of risk assessment and they they develop risk yes. probabilities but, but for scenarios and outcomes. You know, yeah, and and that's contingency planning, not scenario planning. Which is again, I'm borrowing. I'm not sounding clever. I borrowed mm -hmm. that from the link you sent me to the Oxford group. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, or anyway, the point was that a lot of the. <laughs> hard to accuse Boris Johnson of knee-jerk reaction to this, but after two weeks of bumbling through when we had a lockdown and it changed what schools were doing, um, what restaurants could do, uh, and the fact that they requisitioned essential items to put into their own production chain for mm. supply later, it exacerbated the problem. And it, it suggests, with albeit with hindsight, Mm. You know, we're only halfway through this or some of the way through it with hindsight that they didn't explore as many possible futures as they could have done. They didn't see uh, the effect, as you highlighted, of closing this fantastic distribution chain of restaurants, you know, and mm. having them on standby for a time when, you know, uh, they needed they need to behave the way they operate, you know. Um, so. Anyway, we've, yeah, we've well, digressed I'm a actually, little bit from your plan. Uh, well, but I was it's... going to say that 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 I just <laughs> I just had this discussion earlier today. So if people are watching this and the other video, they'll see the same thing occur twice. But it's that there's an interesting uh, concept called post-normal science, which I or PNS, yeah. which I was unfamiliar with until yesterday, and so I was. Um, you know, uh, trying to read and understand it. And it was being touted as a really great way to respond to situations like this. And so for anyone who is like me, who doesn't know what this is, um, they're basically saying that um, it's no, situations like this, like when you have Chernobyl or the Challenger, even this pandemic, these are, these are not, it's no longer feasible for ruling elites to employ experts for persuading the public that their policies are beneficial, correct, inevitable, and safe. And they say that, uh, that the post-normal science uh, movement is a new understanding of science for situations when facts are uncertain, stakes high, values in dispute, and decisions urgent. And they go on to sort of explain that essentially, from what I understand of post-normal science, it's a bit like scenario planning. You're bringing all these different disciplines together, and you're saying, look, we're in an environment that's no longer really well understood. It's very fluid and it changes. So we have to now use a different process to get insights from everybody, pull it together, make quick decisions. And we can't sort of do the kind of ivory tower um, top-down science approach. And I think if I can just pull it up, there's another article uh, which um, is useful in this regard. And again, apologies anyone who's already seen this. But the idea is that there's different approaches that work better for different situations. So they're saying that applied science is extremely well suited to very low uh, stakes with low uncertainty. So that's an area where an expert is extremely good to utilize because they understand the domain and the, the stakes are not as high. So they can give you really good advice. 
Then in the middle is sort of professional consultancies who have to deal with slightly more fluid on certain situations and, and sort of higher stakes. And then they're saying post-normal science is for that outer ring where it's extremely high stakes, extremely uncertain. And that's sort of the situation that we're in now. And so I think scenario planning is a great tool mm. because like you were saying, uh, you know, the, the Oxford group is pointing out that it's about plausibilities, not probabilities. And therefore you are looking at extreme scenarios, not because you think that those are definitely what's going to happen, but rather extremes are more interesting because they, in, in the stuff in the middle isn't interesting. We all know how we would sort of adjust to those things. The extremes allow us to think through what adjustments might be necessary. And it's very possible, but those extremes may come to pass, but not in the way that we think in our scenario. And that doesn't matter. That's fine. It's just that we thought through yeah. what those quadrants might, might entail even if the, the, the reality in the future comes in a different form. So right now it's come as a pandemic, but in the future it could come as a nuclear holocaust or some other event that um, was maybe less expected to people or and they just didn't know quite how it would. But we can think of how things might pan out. And so just to kind of move things along, I think that I'm starting to feel that for sure um, co-location, for lack of a better word, and distributed is maybe one axis because already we can see as we've discussed this, how this is like a concentration of resources and this is like a fragmentation of resources. And I think the scale and scope argument, you know, feeds into that too. It's sort of, is this a, you know, a, um, a distributed sort of scope environment or is it a co-location scale environment? So I like how, that could help us on that axis. As far as the y-axis in this case, I'm not really sure. I think that, um, I think that, oh, sorry, I was also gonna say that, that this is also globalization versus local production or local protection. These are kind of related to this distributed co-location mm -hmm. argument. So in terms of what goes on this dimension, um, I guess, you know, high and low employment, okay, kind of interesting. I'm not sure. It seems like it isn't quite as as exciting. Well, those so. those that's that's conse that's consequence. That's a really a consequence rather than um that's a consequence of the choices that are made hmm. collectively across a population, isn't it? Uh, rather Cause, than Because I was thinking that yeah, this too, uh, like geopolitics yeah, location and, versus yeah, so maybe it's it's uh, you know one of the things out of this um, discussion around the the future of work in the context of a, a risky environment, a co you know a pandemic or uh, an environmental catastrophe, whether whether it's greater drought or too much rain or whatever, you know, is does government is the best response from a society to decentralize? or to become more controlling, i.e. more or less liberal in the uh, choices that organizations and businesses make. So that could be, I don't know if that's quite what you have in mind, but you know, does as environmental or socioeconomic or health related issues become more problematic, does government take more control and become more like a control economy of the Eastern Bloc in the middle of the 20th century? Or does it relinquish control and allow fluidity and self-forming groups, uh, cooperatives, or uh, in, you know, more freedom of the individual companies to, you know, does a country survive better if it relaxes the controls on employment law and other things? Um, to let the market decide? Is it about degrees of market control, perhaps? Um, that's another one we didn't I mean the, discuss I mean, last week. Okay, so, sort of so I'm going to change this, this high, low employment because that doesn't make sense to me. But the automation angle is kind of interesting. But also, I'm starting to think of, um, you know, uh, oh, yeah, sort of like... Um, uh, I don't know what's the what's the opposite of like self-employed or so employed or self-employed or freelance. I guess 
what would you, because I'm looking at those two as dimensions. Uh, are kind on of one interesting. Hand, it's like, um, you know. Well, you uh, call it monopolies, but we don't really mean monopolies. We, we meant, um, you know, the, 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 the scale, scale of, you're talking about the, what percentage of people are employed in SMEs versus large industries well, because, or large? Because one axis that might be kind of interesting in this is whether we go employee to employee versus where, freelance. Yes. Yeah, we okay. go to a, a world where you know people need the security of lifetime employment or steady employment versus one where it's like everybody becomes a freelancer and and they are now an autonomous unit. I mean, that's kind of an interesting. Well, something uh, that dimension. sits something that sits alongside that. Yes, David, something that sits alongside that. And I think employee versus freelancer is a good succinct way of putting it, is how much influence does a trade union have within an, an economic society? Um, you know, in France, the trade unions are still very powerful, still protectionist. Macron was voted in on the basis of reforming the powers uh, of trade unions. He got a very strong support for his proposals. He got strong support for pension reform. And yet when he tried to implement these things, you, the Gilets Jaunes movement appeared and there's a lot of, you know, the classic, uh, I, I don't mean to sound francophobe, but, you know, the classic uh, left elements of uh, trade unionism within France hmm. reared their head again against the very things, the very tickets that he got voted in on. And mm -hmm. um, it's very hard, it seems, for France to reform itself. Um, at the well, ballot box, they wanted to reform. Yeah. And when it came down to it, nobody liked the taste of the reform that they proposed, you know. Well, um, I think so we that have affects, to be, yeah, we have. Uh, you know, a trade yeah. unions going to, trade unions are dead, certainly in the UK, are dead against this gig economy, the freelancers, the zero hour contract, uh, I, I don't know how 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 strong any unions are in the states anymore, but they certainly have. Well, I put I put collective power. bargaining here wow. because I think what's 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 free what frees up the mind of collective bargaining is it doesn't have to be from a trade union. In other words, a trade union is just one construct mm. for collective bargaining, but there could become new ones, other ones. If we're in a freelance world, we might develop different collective bargaining uh, 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 and, uh, act, uh, methodologies. And I think that would be very interesting to explore because I think that in the US trade unions have been largely stamped out and have been given a, a, a very bad name. And this is ironic because in American history, from what I understand, we had some very violent trade union wars, uh, worker violence um, in the sort of thirties and, uh, uh, and, and later because um, the sort of the robber barons and the capital class, the corporate class was so vicious in the way it treated workers that, you know, they demanded um, better conditions and then fought for it. And and those trade unions were largely busted up by um, government. And it was a pretty low period in American history. And then over time, they've achieved the same effect by neglect. I mean, it seems that trade unions are quite, have quite low memberships generally in the U.S., and you know there are people. But were, were they? Were they not? Sorry, were they not busted up because some of them infamously because of corruption that crept in after the Second World War and in the sixties and seventies that that the, the, the some of the American it, unions became. Yeah, I, I don't want to. I, I, I don't want to suggest that that unions are this sort of leadership. You know, always angelic, shining light. But the point is, is that they are a political construct for underrepresented people in the workforce to, to negotiate and bargain with employers. And what I think is important mm. about that, that gets overlooked in, in the sort of discussion about it is that that is a way for people to negotiate without getting government involved. In other words, if something becomes so awful that government has to deal with it because there's terrible inequities or the wages are so low that people are starving to death or something, then you put it all on the onus of government to come up with some resolution. And of course, then we have people who say government should be smaller, it shouldn't be doing all these things. Well, the answer to that seems to me to put it on the front end, not the back end where the government is, but put it on the front end mm -hmm. with trade unions and corporations where those people can haggle and barter and hash it out 
and come to agreements so it doesn't become government's problem, right? But unfortunately, when you undermine except, except government, that, that, except yeah. government, yeah. Sorry, I interrupt you, but the, except that certainly in the UK, it is government that gives trade unions the right, the league, the right in law, or controls the amount of legal. Uh, the, the activities at a legal level. So government allows this for strong or weak trade unions by saying what a trade union can do is either lawful or unlawful. So government doesn't want to get involved in negotiation between unions and the on a case by case basis, but it does set the framework and the, the within which a yeah. trade union operates. I mean, that could be therefore it's that could be putting capacity. that could be like putting a finger on the scales. I mean, it seems to me that. That collective bargaining, of which trade unions is one, one possible method, all, method is that that is there to, to allow for uh, resolutions that don't have to involve the government, so that social, economic problems can be resolved by um, the, the the primary actors together, without it having to become something that government has to deal with down the line. That's all I'm saying, and so. In the U in the yeah, U.S., yeah. No, the trade right. the trade unions are very weak, and so people do not have collective bargaining power by any other means, and so you see a lot of um, uh, workers being treated very badly and a lot of inequities. And a comparison that is often given is that if the, if you look at Germany, I am told because I'm not an expert on Germany, I'm told that they have fairly strong trade unions and a lot of trade union representation, and that those those are very effective in, in getting outcomes that don't have to involve government intervention, that the, that the workers and the corporations come to agreements, they take a pragmatic approach to how these things should be resolved. And there's a lot of uh, trade unions in, uh, in different, uh, different domains there. So um, that to me looks like a kind of a yes, sensible that approach, right? That, that, that these people have constant con contact that is the place where they should negotiate good outcomes. And then, you know, we don't have to deal with a, a social program later to deal with it. So that is, I think, um, so th th that goes back to the collective bargaining. And I think that when you have freelancers versus consolidation of employees, that's kind of interesting because the collective bargaining issue would have to be dealt with very differently. So, so this dimension is interesting to me, um, but I'm not sure if that's the perfect one yet, but, um, we could noodle on that and see. Well, as we said, as we said, David, last week, that um, there are many, many combinations of. Oops, sorry, am I doing this visually? Mm. I like using my hands probably mm. too much. Um, there are many combinations of X and Y axes, and you could swap out employee and freelance for some other axes, and you have to, you know, these become three dimensional plots of behavior really um i think this is you know they're just uh stepping back for it we're on we are you and i understand what we're looking at in in mm. this arrangement because we've been through it we've talked through it and it's probably quite hard for other people to pick up and see this retrospectively mm. so um i think the next time or, or if you want to do one now uh we, we should frame the next conversation with the axes empty at the beginning and the topic we review um you know whether it's a continuation of what we did uh last time or whether we say okay is there another topic we're going to do a scenario plan and we're going to choose a different set of axes um, well I'm either quite for the same topic or I, we're going I, to i have know. to say i'm quite excited how, about how do you want to where do you want to go from here I, I want to take this further. I think we're we're starting to it's starting to come okay. together, and I want to. I, I just want to spend just another minute just thinking about what this axis can be, and then just make a decision okay. and see where it goes. Because, like you said, we could just do another okay. scenario using a different axis. I mean, it, it's 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 what it's it's. It, it, I think it comes down to what it seems most interesting and exciting to to tease out. And I'm really happy with this I, I this meant, axis yeah, here. I meant you know. only only because. I meant only because in a videoed session, starting with a clean tabletop, 
with two axes we've agreed on and then commencing the conversation is easier for other people to follow. At the moment, people have come into this halfway through, in a sense, and we've already laid out a lot of the, the cards. But I, I'm well, totally we're, relaxed about We're uh, We're learning happy. as we go along, and this is very where happy I, to carry I, on. I'm, I'm sharing yeah, people's okay. learning. So, <laughs> so what we could do today, I think, is is – in the because we've been at it for a little while now, I think that what we should come up with today is what our two axes are, and then the next discussion, okay. yeah, we'll fill yeah. it, we'll fill in the blanks. But the point is, is that we've had some good initial brainstorming to help us find those axes, mm. and so I'm really pleased about this. Now I've renamed it consolidated versus distributed, because this axis can mean so many things. It can be consolidated workplace. It could mean, you know, collective bargaining versus non. You know what I'm saying? So. There's a lot that can go on that axis in terms of all these different domains. Yes. And so now I'm looking for an interesting y axis that 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 um, is similarly open ended, okay. but but gives us uh, extremes. Um, well, sticking sticking with the was so we're sticking with the axes you've got there in blue at the moment. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I like this. I like how this one's going. Okay. I've named yeah. it consolidated. Okay. Well, let's, let's stick with both. And, and the north-south employee versus freelance, I think, is a good one because it captures a lot. That's probably a reflection of the degree of, uh, you know, whether 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 states and governments and employment law and union law allow a large number or, or result in a large number of freelancers or result in people running into employment for safety and security and everything else. I think those are good axes to look at. But what we probably need to do next is be more systematic about how we look at your eight uh, subtopics. Uh, and you've got um, economy, legislation, uh, international commerce, geopolitics. I can't read that. Health, uh, social, yeah. tech, and ecology. So, in thinking about the two axes we've got and the extremes of left and east and west mm -hmm. and north and south, I'll call them. Um, what haven't we discussed among those eight? Uh, the, 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 the eight uh, sub. What do we call those subfields or uh, the, the perspectives? <laughs> the perspectives. Um, yeah, I'm just going to make a note to ourselves that this. Let's is... call them the perspectives. Okay. Yes. Oh, and I've remembered what tuner is. Um, it, it's um, I could look turbulence, it up, really. uncertainty, novelty, and ambiguity. So for me, the tuner bit is really not an outcome of one of these quadrants, but it's a, it's a perspective. You know, it's a bit like political, environmental, social, technological as a perspective in the top left corner. I think the tuner is just one of those... Um, you know, environment generations. So, so I have an idea. I mean, how much uncertainty are we dealing with? Yeah. So, so, so this, this in a way, is a debate between some kind of security and insecurity in terms of, in this case, employment. So, like employment yep. security, insecurity. Is there another way to put that, or is that the best way to put it? Employment security or insecurity? Something about whether. Because I think the differences that come out from this is whether it's all on you to become your own enterprise, or whether you're part of a larger organization that that uh, can can that can you know benefit from this trends here. Um, so well, let let's sit with it. We'll try it. If I say um, uh, hi. You know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna be even more well, obtuse because uh, I've because I've got like yeah, but a quick a quick response to that. <laughs> I'm just gonna make it kind of vague for the moment. Okay, well, I... and we can decide like what does that really mean? Well, David, I I think there's a I think there's a a, a response to that is that as opposed to high security, low security, let's frame it slightly differently. You had before um, employee, mm -hmm. sorry employee in the north versus uh, freelance in the south, right? Mm -hmm. And I would say to you, if everybody tends towards freelancing, then your security is relative to other freelancers. If everybody tends towards being employed, there is still 
uh, you know, with no freelancers, um, some people are still going to be highly secu- much more secure than others. So I think hmm. high security and low security is are not the definitions of. I mean, they could be, but I just the different ways of looking at this. Why do we have to be so careful what we mean with, la- with, with the language we use? Don't we? Mm-hmm. Do, do, does my counterpoint to yours make sense? Well, if everybody, for example, was a freelancer then high security, low security depends on how good my group of freelance jobs are or, hmm. Well, what I'm, my security what, is relative what, to all the other freelancers, right? Well, I'm thinking that what, what, why I'm sort of, I, yeah. why I jumped in and did this is because I thought that it is somewhat ambiguous and I'm doing that on purpose because I'm thinking that while the employment security aspect is interesting. Are there other security aspects that are interesting? So for example, one would be competition between individuals. If you have high security, then in a way you might have lower competition in a, in, and that could be positive and negative. In a low security, it could be every man for themselves. You know what I'm saying? So I'm almost kind of seeing security as having multiple facets and I'm wondering which one we should choose because this to me is also kind of nicely open-ended. So I'm looking for something that is open-ended enough to provide for really good discussion, but not so open-ended that we don't narrow it down. We don't know what it means. So I think when we discussed distributed and consolidated, we could already see, oh, that could mean, you know, types of workplace. It could mean um, how, you know, the tech is used, how social effects, you know, health effects, all that sort of came out of that sort of nicely, even though it's ambiguous, but not too ambiguous. So I'm looking for a y-axis that's similar because employment seems to me, it's just one, it could be too narrow a dimension, but you know, because because there's so many different ways to do scenario, scenario planning. We well, could do a very narrow focus or we could do a wider focus. And I feel like at the moment we're exploring a wider yeah. focus, but as we talk about that, we'll, we'll probably come up with more narrow, more narrow versions of it, but um david the, the other the other the other sorry this might seem like i'm dragging you further away from where you want to go but i think this is a risk of we are you and i in this moment, in this instance are talking in hypothetical terms about an organization we don't have scenario planning works with better where there's a a, a specific business in a specific industry sector with a group of people of multiple, with different disciplines, decision makers within that business, in a sense. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. that's where we were introduced to scenario planning as a, as a means of putting that team of decision makers in that business through some um, environmental change, unexpected or, or some future possible world. Mm-hmm. And by making them go through that process, that specific group of people with specific industry knowledge and specific organizational knowledge can have very much more tightly defined conversations. Whereas I feel that you and I are struggling with how wide we're throwing the net of definitions when we talk about high, you think of high security and low security as differently to me because we don't have a set of enough specifics to deal with. That That's what I struggle with a bit. I'm happy to go with it, but I... Well, it's. I think it's because it could, the, there's no... I, I mean, I, I think the answer is yes to both of your points. I mean, we could choose to do it from the point of view of a specific organization, which is sort of how we started. And that is how scenario planning is usually done mm-hmm. because you're looking from the point of view of a, a company or an organization that wants to know uh, what to, how to prepare for plausible outcomes. But I think another use of it, which I guess I have to admit is interesting to me because I'm doing all the storytelling stuff, is to just look at it from a different dimension, which is, you know, what happens to uh, to us in this new world? Um, what happens to us freelancers? So, to the society world? in general. What happens yeah, to, sort of like, to you know, society in general? <laughs> because then it, then, it, then it means what do you and I do? I guess, you know, instead of being a company, I'm thinking, what do you and I do as, as freelancers, let's say, in this mm. new landscape? So yep. we're not a company, but we're individuals that have a certain lifestyle and, and you know, expectations. 
and what does that what does this do to us um and other people like ourselves uh um and that's sort of interesting to me too uh and it and i and, I, and you could do both you know it, they're not at the same time but you could start in one and move to another and vice versa and and they can inform one another mm. so i that i so i'm just going to put this to try this this version <laughs> Which is social security. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Where, All right. Where yeah. that sort of that's a bit so more helpful. Now, <laughs> so now, so now, instead of saying mid-sized company, what if I just said, and I ask you, does this interest you too? If if we're looking at it from the point of view of a freelance or, or or an employee, just let's say no, let's just say a worker. You are a worker. You want to oh, work. Well, okay. A, a straightforward response is if I live in a you're, country you're... like Sweden <laughs> with, with a high degree of social security or Finland or the Nordics or even the UK, really, we, you know, social security has a, is capital SS in the UK. It, it's, it refers to some specific, you know, how much the state will support you if you have no income of your own. It means uh, it's a very explicit thing. Mm -hmm. Um so if I have high social security, I'm prepared to take more risks. If the state mm. provides me with a bigger safety net and my family in terms of the quality of education, the quality of health care, uh, the range of food and nutrition I put on the table and whether I live in a, a safe, whether I've got food and shelter, my basic needs and I include education as a basic need, and I include food and shelter as a basic need, and healthcare as a basic need now. Uh, 200 years ago, that question, what, what, what social security meant was, have I got somewhere out of the rain to put my head down tonight, and will I get fed tomorrow, not have I got a three-month horizon? Well, it meant, could, it, could so I be a... Could I in a highly the... social secure... You know, well, it, it could used to so be, you might say, could I, work, so can I live on the baron's land and can I farm on the baron's land and be allowed to live there and have some well, of my uh, farm goods? Well, uh, that could mean something else. But I, yeah. I, I'm looking at it just to, to wrap on my take. If I live in a highly, high socially secure environment where that's provided by the state, then I'm going to be much more of a risk taker Whereas if I'm in a low social security environment, I want to run, you know, where employment is not secure for very long, um, I'd be looking for a government job, you know. Uh, mm. I'd be looking for something with a pension, with uh, maybe not a, a huge income, but I know that I can feed my family and uh, perhaps um, have a little bit left to, to spare. So curiously, in my mind, to my way of thinking, the highly secure, in the individual that's secure because of a high degree of state intervention or safety net, is the one where I will take more risks. And perversely, in the in the United States, where there isn't a high degree of social security, I would posit, um, actually that is the environment where people take more risks because they have to take more risks to to drag themselves out of the mire, you know, well, drag out, themselves out, out of the gutter. Well, um, out of desperation. So I think that this is very interesting because I, I'm starting to like this possibility. I'll tell you why. For the reasons you just <clears> gave, <throat> but also because, um, you know, when you talk about things like UBI, universal basic income, um, this is debated furiously in different ways, depending upon what perspective you're taking. For example, if you're in a place that is very low social security, like the U.S., um, people, a lot of people argue against UBI because they say, oh, it's going to make people lazy. Because that environment of low security has made people justify their desperation and working really, really hard, multiple jobs and all the rest of it to make ends meet. And so the criticism that's raised by the people that are like wealthier is that, oh, people won't feel that desperation anymore and they won't do the work that's required and we're going to have a lazy society. So that's the kind of the expectation of people in a low social security environment. However, if you're in a high social security environment, they would not have the same expectation. You know, they would say, oh, UBI sounds great because we'll take more risks, just like you're saying. So 
I think that where you sit affects your perspective on that kind of that idea. Yeah, so the, so the um, spectru spectrum of example states is it, it, cr really crudely put could be Scandinavia or France with a high degree of social security, then the UK, then the US, and then for want of any first-hand knowledge, a state in Africa where compared to the, where if you sit in Ghana or Liberia or Zimbabwe, you know, the US looks like it has a lot of social security. Mm -hmm. If I'm looking, if I'm sitting in, uh, you know, a, a failed uh, state on the eastern side of Africa um, and where there's absolutely no social security, and yes, sure as eggs are eggs, there are no lazy people in those parts of the world. Everybody's fighting tooth and nail. And they're also quite entrepreneurial. Um, you know, uh, so my take mm -hmm. on it initially was, well, a place with high social security, I can afford to take risks. Well, I don't know. Are there more entrepreneurs? Are there more startups in Scandinavia? than in uh, in the US? No, probably not. No, there's a, uh, I mean, in the US, we justify our our system by saying that we have a very on high entrepreneurial spirit. And that, I don't know if it's spirit. I mean, I think it's true from desperation. And so that it's true. Maybe that is one of the outcomes of having very low social security is that you get more entrepreneurial type of innovation possibly. I, I'm open to that possibility. It's not the type of society I necessarily want to live in. But it is, you know, effective from that standpoint. So all of these things are going to have pros and cons and trade-offs, and it's going to be interesting to think through what some of those extremes are. So I'm I'm liking this setup because I'm also thinking about this issue here was another really exciting issue to me to debate, and I can see how can you, this can issue. Can you read that out? Sorry, David, I yeah. can't read that. Can you so, read that out for me? So this is about border control and the fear of stranger danger, yeah. the fear of immigration and migrants. Yeah. And I was thinking that if you have a high social security, it's possible that you have less fear of those things. I know that some people may say, oh, they're going to come and take away our stuff. But I think if you're feeling very secure, that is not as much of a, a worry for you. If you're in a very low security mm -hmm. environment, that, this is terrifying. You're like, oh, my God, they're going to steal my job. They're going to live off of what little social security we have. It's going to be a nightmare. So it's easier to, to create, to foment fear of the other in this environment than it is in this environment. And so then when we move to consolidated distributed, I'm fascinated by how this issue is going to kind of play out, you know, socially and and legislatively and politically, you know. So I think yeah. I think to put a to put a bow on it for today, if you're okay with this, I I'm keen to maybe the next session having a clean board with these four dimensions. With this x, this y yeah. axis, this x axis, and and reminding, you know, we can take some notes on this and just have the notes handy, and then just start filling in these quadrants and figuring out, yeah, what happens on these dimensions when you're in these different quadrants. I think I think it could be. I think no, I think exciting. that's yeah. I think that's good. It's yeah, no, and I'm I, I'm very happy to 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 go over the. It's not going over the same ground. It, well, it is going over the same ground, but with a tighter framework, a tighter definition of how we approach it. And I think that's still productive, it'd be useful to do, and interesting to do. Um, the Because what we haven't done is ask, be systematic yet in mm -hmm. our... Um, but saying, that's okay, because... we're going to spend five minutes talking yeah. about the effect on economy in these quadrants, you yeah. know, Northeast, Southeast, Southwest, Northwest. Uh, we haven't talked about uh, legislation systematically in those four quadrants or the role of technology in those four quadrants. And we need to apply that, you know, that discipline, self-discipline. It's lovely not having to be self-disciplined because we can wander wherever we like, but for this to become useful for your tool and as an exercise, uh, we need to learn this discipline. We need to apply the discipline of this. Um, well, I'm very excited to, and I think it would help us to be systematic. Believe me, I mean, you as you as you know from other stuff I do. I'm very keen to be systematic, but I think that we're in an in an emergent phase here where you and I are reading and listening and learning about scenario planning and sort of 
kind of just just looking. We don't have to take it as sacrosanct. We're kind of looking at the tools that they've offered, yeah. suggested, and we're playing with them. And over time, because it is emergent, we will figure out a system. And I'm quite excited about what we've got so far. And also I'm excited because I think scenario planning is 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 a really interesting exercise. And I am amazed. I am amazed that you cannot go on YouTube and find people doing it live for you, just like we are. Because, you know, for something that's been around uh, uh, for these I many decades, I mean... <laughs> You know, know. Where are where are all the it, YouTube you know videos of people doing scenario planning together? It's like what is wrong? Why is this so absent from the uh, marketplace? Uh, David, uh, that yeah. was after our first session. I went away and I looked and I thought, oh, it really is quiet out there on this front. And mm. I I don't know whether that's because we actually live in increasingly stable times. <laughs> um, we don't. It can't be for that reason. <laughs> Which apparently we don't anymore. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So I don't know what it is, but it, seemed, um, it, it is interesting. And I think I really would love to, to, I would love to get to a point, and this isn't for me saying we've got to do this, but I would love to get to a point where we applied this with a group. We find a willing group. Uh, of staff within a friend's company or somebody and say, okay, we're going to walk you guys through this. What does it mean for your business in your sector when we work you through, we do run some workshops um, and I don't actually care whether that's paid or not. I just think it would be very, very interesting when we've got more practiced at this and have the frameworks more clearly in our mind um, to apply that to a, a virgin group, shall I say? Um, I think that's the acid test of whether what we're well, the approach we're taking works or not. I I um, agree with you, and I think and there's actually several several different approaches I like to try. I mean, right now I think you and I are kind of feeling our way around the tools, and so we're going to to set expectations. You and I are going to have to do a number of quite a few of these until we find that yep. system that that works for ourselves and and how we start with what we how we begin the process how we narrow it down how we focus it what what the system will be then i think there's a number of different ways to explore this because yes we can't find many tools on the web or online for this so we're going to make those tools together and we're going to share those tools with people or we're going to get them involved to help us and i think what's going to happen is that we'll develop a process that works, um, you know, perhaps fairly well for a small team of people. And then we're going to explore how to invite people to come in again and again to refine the work that came before. So you could have a living document, as it were, like, yeah. a, like a living scenario plan that just keeps um, correcting, course correcting, changing, being other, yes. other I, people I, I with different go, would, experience come in. You know, they provide some insight that other people didn't have. And I, would, I would go... I would go back to, you know, if we talk about scenario, maybe what you're talking about is something that is not the same as is conventionally meant by scenario planning. Scenario planning, I think, does mean, you know, a group of people who who work their way through iteratively through a scenario and various perspectives on that scenario so that when they find themselves in that scenario, they've already been there. They've been through that experience already. That's the real value of this. And it's a luxury to do it. I suspect scenario planning is is one of those things that is not practiced very widely because it is a luxury. And, you know, how pandemics are not a, an annual event, right? They, well, they may yet, they may prove to be, but they, but, they have, but, the, um, but they're all we sorts tend to have of big shocks, yeah. big adjustments, and then 10 years of getting back to where we were. And then something else has come along. Well, we don't um, have so to just do stop just big shocks for people. To... It doesn't have to be big yeah. shocks. We can look at smaller well, shocks, you know? Yeah. Could... And Trudy in the, the, the lady, I've got to keep an eye on time because I think yeah. it's getting close yeah. to 10 to or quarter to, but the, um, uh, one of the things that the people in the side group mentioned, and I thought it was use it was very useful going through that. Um, she talked about with broader issues and the the greater the degree of tuna, the more tuna there are in the sea. <laughs> I think she said something like that. I may be wrong. You know, 
the shorter the timelines you should be framing your scenarios in. The more uncertainty and ambiguity there is in the scenarios you're looking at, um, the less well trodden this path is. So none of us have, in living memory, lived through a pandemic. Mm -hmm. We're all here for the first time. That's why everybody's so many people are getting it wrong. You know, so shorter timelines, um, faster review or more frequent iterations, I think is what you're alluding to. That adds to the value of it rather than doing, right, we're going to do a scenario plan now for the next 10 years and what might happen in that 10 year horizon. So she was advocating the greater degree of uncertainty, well, the more frequently you should be thinking about this. Um, there, but I think it's important to have the teams of people. They can't adopt a conversation that other people have been through. They won't get it. They won't understand looking at what we've already drawn up retrospectively. They have to be in at the beginning, start to finish of the process. They, it's a process that they go through themselves. And that's where the learning comes from. They can't learn from a conversation we had last week or the week before or the week before that. Um, well, so I, so I was going to say that there's there's two in the interest of time, I'll be quick. There's two things that I, that, that you just said that just came out from that. One is that um, this is one of the very. I mean, there's there's many exercises where looking at how it's done is informative. But I think scenario planning, like you said, is really important for that because the people that go through it together, they're the ones that have the shared experience and the shared learning. And so seeing how the sausage is made is really important. I think that when you look at scenario planning and you see the scenarios that people have come up with and they have the write-ups in each scenario, that's interesting, but I want to know how they got there. I want to know what were the conversations and the ideas that led to that because seeing how the sausage is made in this case helps you get the knowledge that they have to come to those conclusions. And I think that's really interesting to therefore um, even spectate a scenario planning situation. Then the second thing that I, I was going to say, yes, yeah, and, and just quickly, the second thing I was going to no, say, I think, that I think your is, tool, being a, allowing allowing people to spectate, uh, allowing the the stakeholders to spec, sorry, allowing the stakeholders, the decision makers in an organization, to be the live players of this game, the scenario, but having other staff, other wider pool of people spectate it would be really really powerful that's that's a very powerful and tool, and, and also keeping it somewhat open-ended for them to, uh, keeping it somewhat open-ended for them to come in them later and, and and add and adjust things is interesting yep. and the other thing i was going to say is yep. that what i think is interesting about scenario planning and why i was sort of trying to define it in this way is because what i think you will realize as you do it is that you're going to identify trends that were happening anyway all the pandemic has done is accelerated it. In other words, this these movements between consolidated to distributed environments, this was already happening. You know, the pandemic didn't make mm -hmm. this happen. This was a trend that was occurring and the pandemic accelerated it. So I think what we'll discover is that just as scenario planning promises to be, it says, look, we don't know the 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 catalyst but we know the outcomes. We can discuss the outcomes. We just don't know what the catalyst is. And in this case, the catalyst yeah. is a pandemic. I know we didn't see that coming, but the outcomes we can see. We do know that these are the possible outcomes. These are plausible outcomes. We just don't know what the catalysts are. So, you know, but we can use the pandemic for now because it's a really interesting catalyst and it helps us focus our mind on what those quadrants might look like. Yes, and that's that does make sense. That does make sense. I I feel more comfortable going, you know, into this now. But uh, and we probably ought to uh, agree the the terms and the framework more, you know, before we go back online, and record next week, and say, okay, well, how much we could, how much time, just be, just increase our own self discipline because we are feeling our way into this. But it, it's it's. Uh, the more we can get our head into the right space before we meet, the more chance we have of See, sticking to a time frame and getting I, through all the. I, aspects. I love I love the different personalities because Fraser is an engineer, <laughs> and and I am a storyteller. So we. We, we both like telling stories, but the point is, is that you're saying, look, I, I really want to see some discipline in the framework here. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, I do too. But oh, actually, no, I no, like the I, emergent kind of yeah, you know, I, feeling our way around this thing. Perversely, 
But perversely, mm. I see myself as way less disciplined than you, David. <laughs> well, I'm encouraging That's you to true. be. That's true. Because I, because in this emergent yeah, well, phase, I want to open up. I want to keep a lot of possibilities open the table before we start locking it down. You know. Okay. Uh, but I agree with you. We're going to yeah, systematize good. this eventually, and we're going to lock it down. And the next meeting, yes, let's do it next week, and and we can circulate some emails prior to that to sort of tell you know to prepare yeah. ourselves for what, how we're going to systematize yeah. this. What's our next step? So thank you very well, much. Well, it's a, yeah, systematized sounds mm. like it's constrained, but I think it's mm. just being, you know, being able. It's just some the way of being more efficient and making sure we don't don't actually miss things out by being more systematic in our approach. We we capture, you know, and that's why that that top left uh, cluster of um, what do we call that? Well, we need to decide what we're going to call those before we break off this call and before I go and make salad for supper. What are we going to call the four, the, the eight uh, items in the top left corner? Because they're not the same. They need a, they need to be on a different color post-it yes. to yellow are, or blue, don't they? These are domains. I think we can come up with better names. That's just the first pass. So well, we, these are the domains. No, no, the names are fine. But what do we call that group of, what do we call that group oh, of... I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm calling them uh, the the word I keep using in my head is the domains. Like what what are the domains, domains. that we consider okay, um, uh, in this in this and and also uh, you yeah. just sparked another thought which I have to point out because because if people know me or don't know me is that I do believe in structure a great deal and and systematizing things although it may sound like it's a bit arbitrary and whatnot I really do like that and the reason I like that is because I say this a lot. In order to think outside the box, you need to have a box. If you have mm. something that is completely open ended, you can waste a lot of time and not really know and not really have any outcome. Yeah. But if you have a box, you won't be able to draw any conclusions. Yeah. Well, and, and you can push against the sides of those box and try to overcome the obstacles. You can do great things. And the example I love to use often is, you know, Shakespeare you know, decided he was going to write everything as poetry, wonderful, but he writes it in an iambic pentameter, for God's sake. I mean, he decides, I'm going to impose this crazy discipline on myself because by wrestling with this enormous straitjacket of constraint, I'm going to create all this profound innovation. So that's the point that I want to yeah. get across is that, yes, we need constraints and we need boxes, and then we also need the permission to, to push against them and to create new things from that friction from okay. that creative friction so there we go so trey fraser it's been a it's been a joy and uh and i will it always is david time. likewise thank you yes i look forward to it and we'll talk in the meantime about uh, uh structures okay okay will do take all care. the best take care david nice to see you again bye bye, -bye. you too